Okay. Try not to, to close the door. Try not to play right outside the door. Okay. Aye, aye, aye. Hello, Andrew. Hello, how are you doing? Good. One of the questions is, who is H-R-I-T-H-I-K? Is that one of the people? I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you, who is Hithrik Tavari? I think it may be somebody we met on uh, yesterday, Sunday. Um, may, hang on. That'd be great. It's, it's quite a unique name. There's also autopilot and firefly. So, Hithrit, can you put in the uh, chat? You joined from yesterday. Thank you for being here. It's delighting, delightful to have you here. Oh, okay. So, oh, so you're a human as well. Okay, cool. Because <laughs> all I'm saying is, um, I, I, okay, I see you separately. I, I just saw the, the, the note taker. Absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Okay, now we know who you are. Uh, welcome, welcome. Hey, Hitherick, now you can see the computers in my home office. We were talking about the Mac Lab yesterday. <laughs> we were, indeed. I've got a bunch of them here. I'm just checking a, a build <laughs> thing here while we're waiting to see who will join us. I think we'll be quite empty today due to the holiday. Is there a holiday in America land today as well? We don't get a holiday on Monday. Mm -mm. We don't, we're not allowed to have these holidays anymore. <laughs> oh. Well, holidays are, uh, <laughs> That's yeah, why Sunday is so precious to us. That's, I mean, that's the only day we get off. And I even had people writing me yesterday. Um, my, my bosses, my supervisors writing me for stuff yesterday. I was pretty angry. <laughs> it's like, that's, leave me uh, off. Sunday. It's Easter Sunday, for God's sakes. A whole new level of what the heck? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know who else is coming because of a European holiday, but um, I, I'm going to share a little bit of slidey thing here. First of all, a few things to go through today. Of course, today isn't normal agenda. Mm -hmm. We have a kind of an agenda. This thing here. So that's not what I wanted to do. Hang on. Just wanted to be able to see you guys. Okay. Um, we. 
need to um that's the second slide that was very confusing for me so i think and this the, all of these points are up for discussion but i think that by wednesday this week including wednesday next week we need to have the use cases done for reading you know we spent time talking about it i think we're pretty close um any objections or comments well that's good so that means that if you have a use case that you want to add to it you know please do we'll talk about it again on wednesday uh, dna has outlined exactly what it should be yes peter yeah, I was wondering if we might want to think about email integrations too. Uh, no. A lot of documents I get no. via email, and then people no, comment no, 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 on no, no, email. You know, we we can't extend it the scope. We can talk about that in this Monday section, but when it comes to what we're doing for Sloan, absolutely, it, we can't afford to add to the material we use. Uh, please continue, but please just keep that in mind. Yeah, I was just thinking if you just. Uh, I guess it's too far out of scope now. I'll have to give it more thought and maybe in the next round of funding. Peter, I'm say, can I say this? I think it's a yeah. great idea. And I think there's a lot of um, features we want to add to this. And I think that we should have a list. I mean, we do have a list of things we want to add. So that should go on our, you know, what do we call that? Uh, stretch goal. <laughs> But right now, I want to make sure that we've got to make sure that what we've got done is in good code condition so that we can continue building on what Andrew's done so far, which has been great. Bravo, well, I Andrew. Guess, I guess what we really need at this stage is just to have some kind of an anchor associated with each document that could be referenced from other media so that down the road, if we want to bring it in, we have an official designator that we can use and plug it into email or an RSS feed or whatever, that the system would be able to associate the PDF that we're reading in the environment with whatever other metadata is coming in from whatever other source. Yeah, uh, I, I agree, obviously, with Dini, because I always do. Um, however, I had an interesting insight this morning. I saw some video, somebody was doing some work, and I noticed on their screen sharing, they had 300 unread text messages on their computer. I don't have any unread text messages on the computer. Text messages are very different. Click on the person, send a message, you're done. Email is really clunky, I think. You have to find a type in their address because it's not based on the person. You have to do the subject and la la la. And then threading is always bad. So my hope for the community is that we'll start communicating through written stuff. Maybe start with PDF, go over to other things. But I just think email is absolutely horrible. If we could improve it, we should. I agree with that, Peter. Um, but yeah. But Can I say this, though, um, Frodo? I really hate text messages. And I so daily, daily, I get a message from my people that follow me on Twitter, some Twitter messages, Facebook messages, text messages, email, Slack. I mean, it's it, I'm all over the Internet just to piece together what people are asking of me every day, right? So I, I'd rather have emails so I can um, archive it. And I'll know from, when I go back and make a, like, for example, when I start the, the uh, report that I have to do in six months, right, in three more months, I can go through email because it's all archived under Future of Text project. It's hard to go back through text messages. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you, Dini, absolutely. And um, I do personally use different messaging for different reasons, and I'm sure we all do. Um, and this is why I've started unsubscribing all kinds of nonsense emails that I didn't care about before. But anyway, um, for now, Peter, email is, is out of scope. So when I'm talking about use cases, I do mean reading an academic document, either PDF or rendered in HTML, and what to do when reading it. Um, I have a few suggestions on the next page just to kick off a little bit of a background discussion. And then... Also, I think we should think a little bit more about really using the space. I'm glad you're here, Brandel. Um, the interesting frustration that I'm having at the moment is I can put all kinds of things with native vision apps all over the room, which is brilliant for spatial memory and so on. When I do that currently in WebXR, because there's no pass-through, I can't move. 
I'll probably knock over something. And that's a really, really interesting design. It's just a reality right now that we must somehow design for richer environments. Um, we also need to, for Wednesday, at least have a few more people on the list for invited speakers and authors. Uh, we just talked about code review. So Andrew will go through uh, maybe with you, Brandel, if you have time. Fabian has also said he would be willing to uh, not to like check the quality of the code. Of course, the quality of the code is as it should be. Uh, going through no no uh, Andrew uh, as it should be for having done all these wild um, uh, detours and changes. Now the the question is what should be the next steps forward. So if if the code isn't quite a mess at this stage, you haven't done your job right. You know we've been experimenting. Is the whole point. Uh, so it's not a code op optimization I'm talking about. I'm just talking about some perspectives because it's three months take stock, and then we should if there are other design proposals. Um, talk about them now just to kind of kick off what uh, oh yeah sorry peter i ignored your finger and thank you yeah. so i'm sorry i just have one final thought on the email score there and that's that let's forget about reading email and dealing with email threads but a use case that i have when i'm reading a document would be able would be to be able to shoot an outbound email which should be a lot easier so we don't worry about anything coming in but if we could just simply while i'm in the reading environment be able to draft a little note and email it out to someone on a pre-designated list and you could have a json file or something that had all of the names attached to the actual email addresses um sending email should be a heck of a lot easier and much more narrowly scoped and if we supported that it might be a good teaser to get sloan to say gee, you can send an email from the environment. What if you were able to, re maybe they might even get the idea of giving us some more money and telling us to explore in that direction because they're probably as drowning an email as I am. I spend about an hour and a half a day just going through processing all of the Slack and newsletter subscriptions and subspace emails that come in. So that's a huge amount of my academic workflow is just spent triaging academic material coming in through email channels. But if I could send an email outbound from inside of the reading environment, that would be really invaluable to me. Otherwise, I'd have to write it down, hope to send an email later. You just sort of lose the immediacy of being able to shoot the email note. Ooh, Brendel should see this. Let me shoot him a little email with a link to this PDF while I'm looking at the PDF so that I don't lose that train of thought and forget to ever do it once I leave the reading environment. I'm just going to check something. Okay. I, I agree with your issue. I'm not sure about the solution. You should definitely be able to share with the community thoughts and comments as you're reading. Um, so that, that's definitely part of what we're thinking, especially for next year. Um, so, Brandel, uh, you, you walked in just as I was um, saying, we have a few priorities for this week. So, we're just going through that. The discussion today will go as a normal Monday. So when it comes to use case, I put up just a few things just to get a gist of what we're talking about. Um, Dini, if, uh, because you're the, the pro academic, um, just skimming this, do you have any comments for the main topics? Well, I had already outlined them in a message to everybody before, right? Oh, that's, I thought that's... you hadn't finished um, your, your... Well, I haven't finished the, the article, but I gave a list of the things that are, you know, I made a, I made a list to everybody. Like, this is... <laughs> is it, did you so put I'll it on Slack that back or out email? Of the archive? Slack or email? I'll, I'll, I'll pull it back out of archive and I'll share it with everybody again. But, but these are the kinds of things we're talking about, right? Kinds of things, but that's not the list I gave. I, I did give. I did give the preamble of what I'm writing, but I'm happy to find it and reshare it. It's in my files. Okay. Because we kind of... Um... Yeah, we do need to have our use case done. Otherwise, we'll be flailing a bit. Okay. 
Well, it's been Easter holidays and I've been working on a lot of other things. And I told everybody I'd get to it as soon as I could. So I'll get to it as soon as I can. No, 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 that, Vinny, that, that's not what I mean. What I mean is uh, you, you are writing a piece on it, which is perfect, but it really is an opportunity for all of us to go through our different versions of it. So I'm, I'm very happy to find what you have uh, written and put that in. But you are the only one who's worked on this so far. So it kind of into the community. Everybody should have a little bank of it. That's all. Uh, Peter. Yeah, one of the thought at sort of a deep systems architecture level, if we could think about having some sort of a plug-in mechanism so that we could go off and write little bits of code that Andrew could just sort of drop in and integrate with his work without him having to tackle every single task himself. So if there's just some sort of a very, very simple, minimal plug-in API that we could build into the infrastructure, it would be extremely useful for going forward. I mean, that's what GitHub does, um, and it would be very cool. Right. So on the topic, I mean, yeah, I mean that, that's Peter. That, that's a fair point. In a sense, that's what I mean by code review. Um, you know, to talk to to go through the other WebXR coders to see what could be done to not have Andrew do every single thing now. Um, that. But um, yeah, if if you guys can have a, you, uh, I forgot to put my device on. Do not disturb, I apologize. Right. Okay. Um, so Dini and I made a presentation yesterday. Uh, just, I just wanted to, we just thought we would share that briefly with you guys since, um, uh, just so you can see how we presented what we're doing so far. Oh, Peter, is your hand up for something else? Oh, okay. Sorry, forgot to lower it. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. So uh, just to go through a little bit, um, we talked about uh, what's at stake, you know, high level things, the opportunity, things we talked about, and of course, highlighting that academics is our user group. Uh, end goal of this being an environment where people can think, and then we describe the three whoops the three sections of that, which is the software metadata and dialogue. Uh, we had a beautiful list of uh, benefits for a specific headset and WebXR. Thank you, Brandel. We put in uh, what you added to that, and um, showed a little bit of screen recordings. For instance, what it's like to just work on a plain document in a pleasant space what it can be like when you're working in a public space and you're sitting kind of close to people, which is not so comfortable. Also looked at um, the reader and author with um, video here on top playing in um, Safari messages and so on, which is spatial. But as Dini highlighted last week, it's still forward oriented because it's desk based. So um, then we just look briefly at author and reader. And by the way, to those of you who have the vision, if you're not already testing, please tell me. I will try to re-add you because I can't even test my own stuff. So what's in these two little videos is way past what we've actually developed. We then mention what we're doing in the lab. And we showed this cool stuff. Uh, I did a walkthrough of um, what this is, just so you can have a feeling, show the, how we interact, the hands, you know, the sphere, how we can pull things out and so on. It's just a really, really good place to be. Exactly where we should be for the end of, uh, of three months to, to see where we're going. Yeah, I go, this one goes on a bit. You all know what it is. I mentioned visual meta because that's part of what we're supposed to do. Here's a big visual meta. And then mention the whole thing of how visual meta can uh, explain what other data is doing the LLM thing, which is adjacent to what we're working on now, but it's something to keep in mind. And um, then there was the future design thing, which I'll talk to you about in a second. Um, I talked about the importance of 
being properly spatial, uh, here it's in a car, because, you know, why not? The idea of driving through information showed our website and listed the dialog we have. Uh, any questions on that? Where did you go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, the, the tree graphic is uh, was for the LLM one. It's uh, uh, kind of cute bonsai, you know, to grow things. Okay, right. Um, I've been talking a lot, and if you don't mind, I'll talk one more thing. Uh, oh, Adam is saying he's on the road. Yes, a lot of people are Eastering. Oh, hang on, there's something I may need to share to with you guys. One point I would like to make about Rebecca on Vision OS is that... <clears throat> oh, Brandel, um, can you please use your computer? Mike, it's hard to hear you. Then there's a difference, but I will. I will. Oh, oh, uh, thank you. This, so this is better? Yeah, yeah. Cool, because it's not consistently better is the thing. Like I, I tried this for a work meeting last week and it was still uh, garbage. So um, that's good. I'm glad. Um, so WebXR on Vision OS is um, not available. It's in a testing preview. Um, uh, and so that's worth bearing in mind. Um, that's the sort of thing that, you know, the reason why people put things in a testing preview is so they can take them out at some point, but um, that that's the that's the basis on which it's being supplied today, and it's and it's worthwhile to um, characterize it as such um, if if pressed if it's necessary. You know, it is supported on on um, Quest. Uh, it is available as a testing preview on 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 Vision OS. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. And that makes sense. Um, well, we just got an update. It was no, it's not to say it'll ever be taken away. It's that um, that's the sort of level of support and expectation and feature richness that it's sort of supplied uh, on the on the terms of today, um, which hopefully should mean good things um, in terms of there being a future. But that's not that's exactly the sort of thing that Apple doesn't talk about. So. Yeah, I did. Uh, so, uh, Tiwari, actually, how do you pronounce your name? You said the H is silent. Is it Ritik Tiwari? Yeah, it's Ritik. Okay. Uh, yeah, he was there yesterday in our meeting with the um, WebXR people. And I did mention that we have no idea what Apple will be doing in terms of WebXR support, but we have a firm understanding that there is a real commitment to the open web. So, yeah, but that connects with what you're saying now. Um, okay, you know, I'm just going to uh, hang on. Boom, sorry, um, readers being updated. Yeah, I, I'm just going to show you something that is based on me desperately trying to write a use case. And, it, you know, doing use cases to the specific is obviously quite hard. So I'm going to share this and make sure you're there. Yeah, I can see you. You can obviously see this, if not face cream. So one of the, well, the kind of um, counterbalancing things we have here is when you're reading a bit of text, it should, hang on, I have to tell the kids to be quiet. Please play in the front of the meeting the window open from here. Sorry, life, right. Um, we want to have a richer three-dimensional environment, but reading basically needs a flat background. Otherwise, unless it's for a specific effect, it's easier on a flat background. So this is in the environment we kind of currently have. It's also using um, interface styles from native. So the notion is just a uh, top, lower, right, and you get the outline on the right. This is for right-handed people. It should be switchable if you're a left-handed person, point being that in this kind of space where you're not using a cursor necessarily, you can just easily, like a scroll bar on the right, that's why it should be that. It wasn't last week, that's all. And on the left, you can write notes. You can have both up if you want to. And I don't know if you can read the center one because the 
uh, text bubblers there, but the point. Right. Yeah, uh, uh, just trying to move. There we go. So the, this is would be exactly the references we have now in WebXR. Uh, it's just happened to be framed. That's all. And um, you can then go into a wide view like this, either through your wrist or through tapping on some kind of a button. And as you can see here on the bottom, you have a list of uh, how the references should be shown, either a list or a map. And on the left, you have connect based on certain attributes. On the right is to show certain attributes. So no matter what we're doing, we'll need to, to have the ways to say what should be shown. And on the top there, uh, you can see saved views. And this will be connected to your normal library. It shouldn't just be in a frame. And this is the same as you saw the other slide. Um, it should be lively three-dimensional. So it was just to get a bit of discussion on kind of our approach to where we should go next. Cool. Um, oh, uh, I'm not sure if folks have um, noticed um, is it still audible? I have my heater on now. Is it? It's okay. Very good. Um, I don't know if folks in particular, uh, Andrew, have noticed uh, in Quest now. When you suspend the session, you can. Uh, it, since it's suspended WebXR session, you can actually see your two D window up again. Still, um, that mode is called visible blurred, and uh, it'll only work on a Quest platform, so Quest Pro, Quest Three. Um, but uh, what it means is that you're in your WebXR session, you get to see things that are portrayed in VR, um, but you also get to interact with a 2D window at the full fidelity that a 2D window has the ability to be displayed within. Um, that's not a bug, that's by design, and it's something that it's an, an official proposal by Meta. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, and it means that you have a pretty fine-grained surface uh, and then native uh, you know DOM events and layout capabilities that you would be able to use to uh, manipulate and navigate things so in some regards it's the best of both worlds the downside being that you don't you no longer actually have uh, XR inputs uh, the state is called visible blurred so it means that you don't have the ability uh, to use, or the benefit of using your tracked input and controllers but if you construct a system where you're mediating sort of the contents of a document, through the 2D page, um, which is you know, not ideal, but but pretty interesting, then uh, there are some pretty cool things that can come out as a as a consequence. But definitely worth thinking about as, as a way of being able to broker a mixture of rich text-centric interaction uh, alongside uh, alongside the the sort of the broader stroke uh, spatial uh, portrayal of that information. So for the the picture that you had of the that sort of main document sort of uh, with other sort of attendant spatial things around it was really evocative to me of a thing that 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 could be uh, pursued via this mode. Um, it's not it's not on I'm not aware of any plans for it, uh, but it's the sort of thing that often happens by accident um, uh, during various uh, testing and development. So uh, if it turns out to be good, it's not a hard thing for other people to be able to implement at a browser level. Obviously, it's not something you can do. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but I just wanted to sort of uh, call it out as an interesting thing. If folks haven't sort of taken a look at it at all, uh, um, then it's it's worth understanding sort of some of the dynamics and practical consequences of. Yeah, I mean, this is um, why we're so grateful, Randall, that you made us think about this for a year and a half, two years before the headset came out, because now the difference between WebXR and Native and Quest and Vision are real. And we need to think within that, but also beyond it. And, uh, that, you know, that's partly why I've developed Reader and, um, and Author yeah. for, uh, for Vision, so that, uh, we, you know, to really get the feel for what that means. Yes. And then you know how we can extend it. It, it. it is very frustrating to um, not have pass through in WebXR. Even if it was only for the viewer that it had no informational value sent to the serving web page, 
it could be quite uh, quite useful. Even yes, if so that definitely that that would be a must have uh, is to make sure that uh, a web page is not a is not uh, is there's a mechanism for a web for a web page not to be privy to that information. One of the challenges today is that uh, there are a limited set of ways to do that via WebGL, which is the the main way that um, that WebXR is rendered. And it's a possibility that Web GPU, which no one has implemented in WebXR, um, could be a, a more future forward way of being able to construct privacy preserving layers of information. Uh, so that's something that, you know, uh, I've been speaking, speaking to the folks at Google about uh, people who are responsible for WebGPU, WebGL. Uh, and I think there's some links there, but yeah, it's there are, there are privacy and security challenges that are are not trivial. It's not it's not just a matter of wanting to keep the the fun stuff for the for the paid customers. It's it's the uh, the very difficult engineering of finding a way that allows this to happen in a way that everybody agrees with. Yeah, yeah. As I mentioned yesterday in the other presentation, when asked a few people who are real knowledge people recently have asked me, and I'm sure they've asked you guys too, why would anyone work in this stuff? And at this point, I don't have a good answer for them. And I think that's very exciting. I don't think that's horrible or negative. Is if you have a good size screen or two and a good keyboard, most of this you already can do, you know, if, if the system is there. But the thing is, it isn't even developed for 2D, what we need. Oh, sorry, important message. No, yes. we're just text messaging back and forth behind the scenes. So he's asking about asking other people to do use cases. And my response is ask everybody. I mean, everybody should be doing it. So just go for it. Oh, yeah. No, I, I thought you had to uh, go out since uh, you weren't on video. But yeah, no, that, well, I don't normally come on Mondays, but I thought today it'd be a good idea to drop in. So I'm just listening while I'm working on Monday morning. So I usually am not here on Mondays, but I'm here lurking. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, uh, lots of points. Um, it's 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 an interesting point now being at, at the three month mark, which is not the quarter mark because we'll be showing our work in September. At the hypertext thing, that that is our big goal, and um, we there, there are so many ideas and things to do. Um, Andrew, a question for you specifically. Uh, in, yeah. In, in order for us to kind of fork the code. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, because one of the things we're talking about is building an environment of um, of kind of other aspects. Is that something we can do or should do? Or, or you know, we don't want to just have necessarily one thing. If we have one brilliant thing in September, that's fine. But we don't want necessarily want that. For you, yeah, I mean, better, what would help you uh, to comfortably move forward? Is my question to do all kinds of fun things. So with GitHub, you can easily fork the code. Um, should we? I don't know. Um, I don't have like the best base code there now. If we want to have like multiple different applications running off of the same code, um, people are welcome to try if they'd like. Uh, th this has been built just kind of clobbered together with a whole bunch of different tests, like I mentioned earlier. So um, if people see use in that, they're welcome to use it. Um, if we want to just have different experiences to demo, it might just make sense to have them make it in whatever is most comfortable for them. Um, like I know a lot of Adam's demos uh, were just totally their own thing, uh, but because of that, they demonstrated things that my code couldn't do. Um, so if we're looking for just a whole bunch of different prototypes, that would probably be the best way to do it. Um, of course, if we want to have a whole integrated system where they all can talk to each other and stuff like that, it gets a little bit more complicated because then we have to all agree on some sort of fundamental principles on how the whole code works before we start building our own practices on top of it. Um, 
And yeah, that'd probably be more of a collaborative effort before we split off. So I guess, what's the vision? That would be a better question for me. What's the vision? Oh. Do you remember when uh, Randall, first time he did this? In I, I walked into that, yeah. <laughs> That's the vision. Uh, well, well, one thing we need to do, which is part of our initial promise, is it has to be the user's own data. Now, um, I talked to Adam briefly. He's in this Easter thing in Sweden. He just has no real time for us. But he mentioned that, well, rather reminded me that him and Randall suggested a means to get stuff from the computer onto the headset that didn't require a server. I think that should be our priority now so that we don't just have these um, references that are static, because uh, I know you made it so they don't have to be static, Andrew. But I think that mechanism needs to happen because, uh, sorry for repeating myself, but people need to see their own data. Otherwise, it's a, just a demo. Right. Um, the URL link that I put at the top, um, I get the feeling no one's tested that. Um, it does work for sort of any data, but it has to be formatted the same as the hypertext papers. So it's, it's very much not any data. Um, of course, that's a terrible interface. And yeah. it's something that we will change with, uh, with time. Um, but yeah, the base code is there for that part. Um, so it shouldn't be that difficult to connect it to uh, whatever way you want to stream it from the computer. Um, I believe the next step that we want to focus on is finding a way to integrate with uh, like an export from reader. I think that was what your vision was for that part. I don't know if that's still next step. Um, oh, yeah. I've been working on the save and export bit, which has given me more hurdles than I expected, but I hope to have that um, presentable on Wednesday. And then we can move forward on to um, that next part. Yeah. Or at so least I can. Other people can work on whatever they'd like in the meantime. So uh, I have a question for you, Dini. Um before I answer Andrew's question. And that is, um, hang on. Uh, one second, and this is kind of an important one. Sorry, just see. The, the question is on uh, PDF, because we, we talked about the user's own data, but now that I've built Reader, as for our community in vision as well. I think we have fulfilled our obligation to show PDF and uh, XR. Hi, Dini, sorry to drag you back in, but this is a really important question. Um, now that we have reader, yeah, okay, yeah, the question is now that we have reader native in the web XR, do we still need to render PDFs or should we render based on the HTML of the documents to have different views? I'm going to say this. I think Mark Anderson would prefer the HTML, as would I, but we all know that our colleagues in the field will never use an HTML page unless they absolutely are forced to, that their libraries consist of PDFs. So if we're going to be building this out, as we said we're going to build it out, we have to use PDFs as our main document format. That said, we also have included in our language that we'll try a lot of other different types. So I think we shouldn't turn our backs on other types, but we can't turn our back on PDF as much as I hate them. And Andrew knows I hate them. <laughs> oh, it, it's, it's not a question of turning our back on PDF. Absolutely not. What I'm saying is because Reader has, for our vision, has been made for the project and will be open. And by the way, I have made the, I don't know if it's done yet, but Adam will have access to all the source code for reader and author for Mac, iOS, and Vision Pro. So he can do his own versions, which means we have different ways to integrate. Anybody else can have that as well. So now that we can have multiple PDFs floating in many dimensions, uh, to be able to integrate from that library into WebXR, I think that really fulfills the requirement where we can use Andrew's time to have much more dynamic views and then still say we've done the PDF properly. No, <laughs> no, because our deliverables are based on the PDFs. I mean, it's reading and writing with PDFs. We can't say we did, we tried it and then we moved on. We can, we need to stay with it and try things as side quests. Okay, that, that, that's really important because you, you didn't mean writing PDF, right? 
I mean, for, for authors. No, but we're talking about authoring and reading texts. Yeah. So we're, I mean, what do you talk? I mean, we're not going to code in HTML in the in the headset either. No, no, <laughs> right? no, no. What, what, I, what I feel is that to really use the different parts of the virtual environment to their best, what Andrew is developing is a swivel chair experience, 360, not front facing, but it's also not a walk around environment because you'll bump into things because we don't have the, the pass through in WebXR. So to me, that means that we should probably really try to make that a multi-dimensional environment where we focus on references and things. References are very, very extractable, even from the PDF to put into WebXR. So the benefit of being able to read a plain PDF in WebXR, I think is much smaller than to read them in a native app. That's why I built the native app, so that we could fulfill that. But you feel that the PDF has to be in WebXR as well, right? Yeah, I also think as bad as it is in the headset, right, uh, in the uh, Apple, Vision, uh, Apple Vision Pro. But we also have told the Sloan Foundation we're working on open source. So as much as I love what you're doing with reader and author, that's another side quest. It's an important one. I can but it's not, what we, it's not what we promised. We, we, we did have it. In the original version, we're working with author and reader, and we took it out. And what we submitted didn't include it at all. It is included. It, we it, didn't it take it out. No, 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 no. It, it's there in the latest version. It says it, it will be connected to other environments as pretty much exemplified by author and reader. So, so it, it is in that. But, I, but that mostly refers to on other platforms like Mac or iOS. So, okay. So, so that means that we need Can to... Can I answer Peter's question? I, I saw Peter's question. Um, I opened up GitHub to everybody who sent me emails. And so if you sent me an email, you should have access to GitHub. If you're using a different email address, then you're not able to get into GitHub. So right now in this chat, give me the email address that you want to access GitHub with. And I will make sure Greg opens up GitHub with that email. And remember, I, I collected a lot of... this two months ago. A lot of what happened, I think, with the, the GitHub stuff is people sent their email in. The invites were immediately sent back, but they expire after a week. So if you didn't accept the invitation, um, it's expired and you're not in anymore. And we just have to do that. But I also reissued again. them again. I did it twice. Brandall's shaking his head. Thank you, Brandall. <laughs> I'm um, not losing my mind. Yeah, I recall something to that effect. I, I, I explicitly elected not to get access. So um, I. Wouldn't be surprised if I tried and would fail today, but uh, that's kind of by design. So drop your email address in the chat and I will make sure you have access. And Greg's back from his holidays, so I'll get it done today. Okay, Peter. Okay, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm 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 with Danny on the validity of PDF for the spec the spec uh, in general, but also specifically to to satisfy the scope of this loan grant. I think I think that there are things to do with the specific presentation of PDF. PDF is so much more. I mean, you know, this is your talking points back at you, Frodo. Is so much more robust as a representation of a fixed presentation of a document, and it's going to have so much more resonance with the academic community as it stands today, that I think that it's going to be a very useful thing to be able to do, as well as to be able to counterpoint against the flexibility of HTML to the extent that you wish to have that as a representation. But being able to keep that claim that um, what you're ingesting at some level is HT uh, is PDF, I think, is a, is, a, is a really powerful claim to be able to have. Um, and using PDF.js to be able to kind of make that, heat, make that hop like almost immediately is also totally fine. It's just being able to to really sort of defend that claim. I think is 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 really valuable. Um, yeah, I, I'm fine with that. But the the key thing that I really want to have locked down now, which is something we uh, we looked at in the beginning, we need to have the user's data be uploadable now. That has to be the priority. So yeah, um, yeah. so uh, Randall, the method of using the user's computer to do that. Uh, would you mind walking that through that again so that Andrew can tell him whether he feels that's a viable way of approaching this? Yeah, so um, when you have a computer and uh, you, ha you have a, a laptop and a, and a headset on the same network, 
Uh, you have the ability to set to have a, a small host on the on the laptop or or other computer. Um, then you can use a peer connection using something like peer, PeerJS to be able to have an open pipe. Um, and then if you uh, uh, disengage the loading and parsing from the 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 loading from the parsing, then what it allows you to do is inter intervene with a with a message passing system um, that allows you to connect any arbitrary client to any arbitrary server in the sense of being the thing that happens to be doing the stuff, and uh, and that just means that you can connect any device to any other device and and uh, sort of exploit the the benefits of being able to do it on there. Um, I. I haven't tried drag and drop on vision mods. I haven't tried. Um, I I believe it should work. I've been told that it should work. You can definitely open files and and you get the, the files dialog. Um, but drag and drop should work there. But you know, in all likelihood, most people do not have you know a trove of PDFs lying around on their on their headset. So uh, have, having the ability to drag those in in the same way that I'm doing with that uh, various sneaky paste um, URL. Uh, that has has the reader capability set up on it. Um, so yeah, it's it's just a matter of being able to stand by having a um, a a peer connection um, between one device and another. You can actually use a the open source peer server, or you can stand one up yourself. Um, it's basically just for brokering the immediate and initial connection. So um, to my knowledge, that information is private from that point on. Um, but I'm not a security researcher, so, um, and then you just are sending messages back and forth, and so those can be as big uh, uh, as they can be permitted, or as small as you can be bothered in terms of the granularity of the information that sort of constitutes a valid transfer of of documents for the purposes of the um, the author parsing that I did. Uh, I guess, geez, like over a year ago now, right, Rhoda? Um, I was passing messages back and forth at the granularity of the individual nodes and individual connections. And uh, it processes in almost real time, it seems, when you open it up. You know, if you have your headset open on the page and then you have the uh, the document, the, 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 the your computer open on the page, you drag an author document. It, it seems more or less instant that I that I see that it, that it loads it and you can, you can delay those things. You know, you can turn it into a message queue, all of those kinds of things. But, uh, but that's the basic premise. Uh, so if you've used one before, it's that. If you haven't, uh, I can go into more detail about how you negotiate a system via uh, PRJS or, or equivalent socket IO, that kind of thing. Wonderful. So thank you, Randall. Um, the concept makes like a lot of sense. Um, I remember that from last time you explained it. It was great. Um, I've never done something like this in JavaScript before. So I understand the concept and implementing it are two separate things. But um, I will definitely go that route um, once cool, cool. that is the priority. I yeah. think it'd be great to um, have. So the, the uh, question then would be, Randall, how much handholding could you give Andrew for this? Because this is such a crucial bit. If, if he's I, mentioned the pure pure JS, that should be enough to get me in the right direction. Um, yeah, but if yeah. you have any um, like specific resources, um, like link to them, that'd be great. As long as it doesn't uh, I, take you much effort. Yeah. Yeah, the, the code pen that I have uh, about auto peer uh, should um, should should work should sort of just work. Uh, and I don't necessarily recommend that you use auto peer, but auto peer is a thing that I made, which is like two three lines of code to have a peer uh, coordination framework set up on a page for the purposes of zero effort uh, information sharing. I think we looked at it in in this call before. Yeah, that sounds fabulous. Yeah, I think that was the one we looked at with um was that the reader turning into the visual map that just goes global as soon as you upload it? So that that is just using a peer connection. Auto peer is a uh was a concept that I had here. Um and it's the the one entitled This page automatically coordinates with zero effort, right? On code pen. Uh, it may not work for me at this instant just because I am on my VPN. So that's the one thing to bear in mind is that um, this uh, this approach can at times be confounded by um, by uh, you know 
well-intentioned um, institutions' um, preferences for you know ironclad security. Um, let's see if this is okay. No, it should it might be maybe it's not working. Um, doesn't seem to be working at this instant. Gotcha. We we would want it to be like a um, just on the local network rather than just uh, open and global, but. Uh... This is cool. I think yeah, this is yeah. one that you demonstrated before. I don't remember. I thought it worked last time, but I don't see the mouse working this time around. Yeah. Um. I I'm not sure. Maybe it's because I. Um. In the meantime, I did have one other thing I wanted to comment on with the. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Now I see it. Um. Comment on with the. Uh, PDFs in the headset. I, um, I was under the impression that a couple of weeks ago, we had all agreed that um, using the HTML exports of the PDF was still a PDF and that was acceptable for the project. Um, if it isn't, I do need to point out that most of the uh, connections we have right now with the citations won't work um, because it's specifically using the HTML tags to find things. Uh, which aren't in a PDF. That was the whole point why we went the HTML route. So if we're switching back to the PDFs in the headset, um, we are going to be undoing a lot of work. That's okay, because that's the whole point of like testing and working through things. Uh, but just people need to be aware of that. And I'm not sure how we'll consistently grab pieces of citations anymore, um, but I, we can discuss yeah. as a group. So, so my, my view on this, and and I, I will, I think, as we should all defer to Dini's view of, of compliance to the to the um, system, is that uh, as long as there is a an entry point of ingestion uh, with PDF of, of some level, um, there is no particular need for it to retain the form of PDF there and after, as long as there is an open ended mechanism for for new PDFs of any sort of valid. Type uh, to 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 sort of enter the system, then we should be under no obligations to preserve the PDFness in order to do that. D D Dini, does that sound off base? It sounds fine. Great. Does so, that make sense? It's on point. Yeah. Just, I mean, I want to go on record saying it's really hard because I don't want to sound like I'm the gatekeeper. No, at no. the same time, you know, we're looking at a grant with promises. And I've got to make sure that we follow them because we want more money. <laughs> yeah, I'm very <laughs> conscious. Of say this, we can do whatever we fucking please. Know that we can do whatever we want, but we're not gonna. We're not gonna. We won't get the second year of, of funding, right? Number one. Number two, they won't give us any more money after that. So, I, I frankly, I like getting money from foundations. <laughs> yeah. No. Th this is, oh, sorry. Please. Sorry. Please continue. No, I just say it's it's important, and and I just feel like I'm in this position, all the time, like like the mother, no, no, you can't do that, no, Froda, no, bad boy, and that just it's not the position I want to be in, and that's why I've shared that document with all of you, so you can see what's there, so I don't have to do that. I don't want to be that person. Yeah, <laughs> I'm no, really I, 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 person. I, I'm lovely. I, I'm actually quite lovely. <laughs> no, I, I, I definitely get that. Um, get that. Uh, I, that's clear. Um, I actually uh, spoke uh, to a mutual friend of ours, Andrew Hedges. Um, I love uh, Andrew recently. Hedges. He was my boss. He was the guy who hired me to Apple. Oh my God. Um, yeah, he, he's been a he's been a phenomenal mentor to me over the many many years. Even though he was only my boss for seven months, he was. Uh, he he would love to see this if you if you get the chance to run this past him at some point. I actually, actually have met him before. I knew I've known him. Yeah, from yeah. some past life, yeah, yeah. So he he was a. I think he might have been at University of Washington, uh, Vancouver at some point in the past. But yeah, he's um he's he's a he's a really he's a really, really great fellow. But anyway, um, can I ask one more question? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, you, can I ask you one more question? Have you come across a guy named Matt Jockers? Matt Jockers does not ring a bell. Um, Good. Okay. <laughs> he was my <laughs> former dean, and I didn't like him. <laughs> now they have this on tape. <laughs> Yeah, he, one needs to to probe the social network in order to make sure things. No, I'm so I'm I'm I I, I absolutely sympathize, uh, Dini, with the what what you feel that 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 kind of um, role puts you in a position of. But it's it's absolutely critical. Um, uh, I, I've been involved in sort of research, creative technology stuff for ten years, and uh, at, at Apple, 
And uh, there, there are just innumerable times when somebody will offer something promising, then change the goalposts. And the thing they're offering is still promising, but because it doesn't do the thing that they said it was going to do, they don't get to do it again. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's, right. and it's, uh, and uh, being able to put, you know, admittedly, you know, things onto an ever expanding list of in interesting things to follow up on. One keeps you in better graces to be able to receive the next round of whatever it is, be it salary or budget or funding or or just whatever kind of opportunities uh, exist within the common currency of an organization. Uh, and two, it actually changes what it is you have the ability to explore because there is something uh, challenging, never, uh, like uh, undoubtedly, but nevertheless um, different and important about discovering what happens when you finish stuff. <laughs> when I don't want to say that. I hate, I absolutely hate Microsoft and I don't like Adobe products. I've been mad at Adobe since, I don't know, Microsoft, micro media director, right? Since they killed director, then they killed flash. So they're not my favorite people. And Microsoft has never done favorable. I do think that author and reader are far superior products for the kind of things we're trying to do. I do, I do, I do. But the other thing that I have hope for is open source. I do think we've got to put our, energy into open source as much as i teach in our program the uh you know unity and unreal engine and all these things that we have to teach adobe products out the gazoo we still have to be looking for solutions that are going to be better and I, that's just part of it and i and i'm i'm heartened by the fact that apple is not against webxr that it actually is looking at webxr because apple has had a reputation of being a eco closed ecosystem and um, and as you know, I said as I said to folks yesterday in our meeting, I'm not an Apple fangirl, but I've been I'm an Apple girl, right? I've been using Apple forever, and I do not use anything that's not Apple at all. And when I was forced to buy a PC this year, it's still sitting in the corner of this room, and I don't use it, right? I, I pretend I use it, but I don't use it. Don't put that on tape. Anyway, um, but I do think that it's important that Apple wraps its arms around WebXR, and we talked about this yesterday with our meeting with Rithic. I'm hoping I say your name right, Rithik. Rithik. Yeah, that that's right. Uh, just a double tick. That's Rithik. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Frodo, did you want Rithik to introduce themselves? Yeah, if, if you would like to, I, I just put a little comment here in the in the chat. But uh, just on the on the current topic, I absolutely would like to have PDFs in WebXR. That's not really the question. The, the question is partly where to focus now. And I'm very, very glad that we've decided the local host will be the model. So you got to keep your laptop going when you put on your headset in the beginning. You know, that's good. I also think that the JSON containing the user's library on Mac should synchronize. That's partly what this does. And of course, PDFs are a lot longer than a JSON string. So that means that um, we need some kind of a mechanism to tell the headset that this was the, if there was a PDF open on the computer, transfer that first. It's very likely that's what they want to keep reading. So these, these mechanisms are uh, perfect. We also have to make sure we utilize the best platform and make it open to make the best experience for the person. So that's it. I think we're all in entirely in agreement on that, right? So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, Andrew's focus now will be get stuff there. And when it comes to the JSON, Andrew, uh, if you can give me a sample request I sent to my guys, uh, Brandel, if you could please give me a pointer to where my guys should look to implement it on this side, uh, either, or, or do you think it should just be in a website? I don't mind building it to reader. You click a button. As long as we make that code open, free, and documented and available, then any developer can use it too, right? Yeah. So what you'll need on uh, in, in a native app context is uh, the ability to use some, you'll need two main things. Uh, one is an endpoint to send the socket connection, whatever based uh, uh, channels. Uh, you'll need to negotiate them um, as well. So if that means you want to use um, PeerJS with its I believe what happens with PeerJS is that it does hit like a Google server somewhere for the um, 
intermediation and and the the uh, the matchmaking of being able to say this is a peer this is a peer you got to talk to each other um if you don't want to do that then you will need to have some other mechanism be it you know a server on the on the computer or or uh, present in your application that is able to start that connection up a, a, a problem we've had with a lot in the beginning we're having again now you're doing a lot of ifs please consider me not anyone else but me ignorant enough for the ifs to fall on deaf ears what what you decide and that andrew's happy with we'll just do it now, i'm not saying you have to make all, if there are real decisions of course as a community we're not just going to put it on your shoulders but i mean a lot of this is i can't usefully contribute to in a if situation does that make sense Sure. I, I guess my what I was unclear on is the level of hardbound information security you want to play by. Um, so, I, so in the event that that is not your largest concern and that you don't have the fear that um, you know state actors are going to be breathing down your neck, then I would just go with the Google solution. Uh, Do you agree with that, uh, Dini? That's not acceptable inside Apple. <laughs> is all <laughs> for obvious reasons. So it's something that I'm ha I'm used to having to hedge there, saying like, if this is the level of disclosure that we need for this project, then we need to stand up everything ourselves, and then we need to make sure that it all goes past SEER and has to go past Infosec. Um. So so yeah. So that in that context, uh, just use just use PeerJS peer largely as it is. Um. That will allow you to broker those connections. You'll then need to know what a valid identifier is. I, I think I, I'm pretty um, bullish about the, the approach that I outline and sketch in that code pen that I have, the, the auto peer, um, where you use an identifier that's based on a person's identity or, or other thing like that, and, and then being able to kind of broker the connection on that basis. Um, well, because you need to have a unique... Hmm? What we talked about that bit last week was email address plus a single word or a single number. So it can't just be guests, you know, I can't just take Deanie's email address and therefore eavesdrop. It has to be two things, not like a password, but just almost anything. Is that Correct. something and, and, you're to? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And something generated so that other other participants wouldn't have the ability to guess it simply on the basis of your credentials. Um, but that doesn't need to be robust, and it's not a particularly interesting part of the sort of the con conditions of the grant. Uh, people can do more innovative things with that, and you can just plug them in. Um, so, so that... And then the slightly more complicated thing is you need to agree on the message passing format. You need to have a basic notion of the moving parts that you want to be you want to be shuttling back and forth across these participants, and that's going to depend on what's displayed. If it's just the two dimensional textual document content, um, then that's less controversial. But it means that you have less ability for the computer in the mix to be able to do determinations about the display. So it's kind of at that point, though, it's it's easy enough for people to be able to bolt on whatever form of message, as long as they you are either using a simple code base uh, in order to to sort of conceptualize what these messages are, or you have a well formed representation, sort of an API doc uh, uh, of what it is that you're passing back and forth between those participants. If that, hopefully, that that makes sense. Andrew, how do you, does that make sense to you? I mean, yeah, conceptually. Uh, well, not uh, exactly clear on how to implement it, but that is something that uh, research into peer JS will do. So we right. should be okay. So, and I'll I'll ask so, you questions if I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, no, feel 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 free. So like the what all, all I mean is that once you're in a peer JS world, then peer not pure. Um, you're in a situation where you're passing messages, and so then what you would have is a message like create node, and then you would need to say that a node has a name, a UUID, and, uh, a, and an X and a Y and a Z, uh, and a scale, maybe, you know? And so you need to agree on the basic terminology of what what needs to go in and who needs to invent what. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there may be some things, for example, like the Z coordinate that are irrelevant in the context that you're constructing the node graph on the part of the computer because you just haven't been in a position to, to invent those. So th then you either need to make those values up uh, on the fly once the, it sort of lands in the uh, immersive environment, or uh, uh, or you need to make sure that the um, those things are being initialized and instantiated with reasonable null values, like zero right. uh, for, for Z and stuff like that. 
Yeah, I mean, um, that's a great example with the Z value um, because we're going to have like a, a reader snap distance by default. Um, so that can be changed inside the headset, but an export from author wouldn't care. Um, That's right. But I assume, say, like if you want to keep your um, your mind map layout thread, um, yeah, then right. an X and a Y would matter. So That's right. we'd keep those and then not worry about the third dimension. Um, I think ultimately what it's going to boil down to is, Fred, you put in as much data as you want on your end um, because I feel like your developers are going to have more of a pain going back and making changes. Um, it's easier for us on our end to just be like, okay, well, we, we passed in like the author, but we don't really need that. You know, something like that. Like who cares? That's yeah. such a minimal amount of data. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it, the the speed of computers these days it's it's a little sickening, honestly. Uh, in terms of what it means that you can get away with wasting, uh, you know, printer drivers being a testament to that, obviously. Um, so, uh, yeah, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be too worried. The, another question what might be: Do you want to make the mechanism of transitions transmission stateful or not? Uh, my recommendation would be to not. Um, stateful means that you can go like I'm in insert mode, I'm in edit mode, or I'm in put them into this child mode versus that mode. And um, in general, those things get you in trouble because dropped packages, uh, sort of uh, mismatches of contexts, can get in trouble. Get you in trouble. So being um, more verbose and stateless is generally better. Ronan, sorry. That's a really really good question. So um, and Dini, I'm so grateful you're here today. Um, it, the way that I view it is, um, you know, as I said, any client outside of the headset should easily be able to integrate with the system. So that means that they can take advantage of whatever special things they have in the outside world, right? So what needs to be updated are um, two basic things. One is basic information about every document, you know, the title, also the document name and so on so that when the documents are uploaded, we know what's what. And two is the library information. That will include um, which documents are favorited, which documents are hidden, and also the X, Y, Z, when it is used. Because to me, it is clear that the spatiality of the WebXR environment will mean that we may end up doing some amazing graph map type things in there, and they need to be able to be sent back to the outside world. When they're received by the mm -hmm. outside world, um, we will have the X, Y, Z, but it needs to be, it, it can be stored as its own thing. Let's say you try to open it and say, no, this is three-dimensional, you're on a flat screen, forget it. Or there may be a rendering mechanism that says, I'll ignore the Z dimension. That's entirely for the developer of the outside software to do. We just have to make sure that we explicitly can load it and send it. And that's totally fine to do for me. And I'm not speaking computer, I'm speaking human now, at the end of a session. Uh, is, does that make sense for you guys? Does that fit what you're talking about? Yes. yes uh, just to clarify, but you said um, not done by a computer or done by you. Are you talking like uh, you click an export button and then manually save it somewhere rather than it just flies back to author? I would I would like it to automatically fly back. I mean, the, the dream okay. is the dream scenario that we talked about from the beginning is I'm working on my laptop or something in my library, meaning in readers library or whatever software library. Oh, I need a better view. I put on my headset. The least amount of things I need to do to make the data go up, the better. Similarly, when I'm done in the WebXR experience, the least amount of stuff we need to do to send it back. If we have to, for now, have a giant button that says send back, we'll have to do that. But I'd love to hear what you guys think to make it more elegant. Yeah, I mean, for testing, that's how it'll start. But uh, we can definitely aim for the, the other route once we get the peer-to-peer -peer set up. Um, there will have to be something that determines like when it goes back, unless we want to constantly be streaming all of the data. Um, because from author to the headset, it's rather small data. Um, assuming you know the biggest is going to be the PDF itself. Um, now, if you want to send it back, it's a lot larger. Um, and currently, I'm dealing with export issues with uh, Troika text, which is stupidly large because of all the glyphs. And um, it doesn't actually save. So it's just like useless data. Um, so oh, I got to figure out a way around that. 
You're, what yeah, are was, you trying to save? With uh, well, the current current project is to export the entire scene, uh, not like literally the scene in code, but like the visible scene for the user. And then so you can re-import it to someone else, like a library. Um, but Troika text doesn't save because it runs off shaders. Um, so I'm doing right, like right, workarounds right. on that. But um, because of the way I have it set up right now, it attempts to save all the Troika stuff. So we have like a massive file and then it just overwrites it once it imports. So I, I got to find a smoother way of doing that. Right. So um, the thing that I did for my for timeline VR saves to GLTF and everything else, um, uh, it uh, where I and you you can probably use basically the same thing. Uh, uh, where what I've done is uh, it, it it actually parses HTML and then creates. Um, do you know what a an atlas, a texture atlas is? Uh, I've I've used them in game engines, not so much in JavaScript. So I haven't yeah, created them so, from so, scratch. Yeah, so a texture atlas is just where you have a bunch of textures that you need to use laid up on a single on on a single sheet. Um, and what I do is dynamically generate a texture atlas based on all of the font variants on a page, and then uh, then I serialize uh, all all of the sort of DOM content such that you can kind of construct essentially what exactly what Troika is, except it was using alpha blending rather than rather than a sign distance field texture atlas the, the the actual geometry of um um troika is perfectly appropriate for export uh what you need to do what needs to be done is to convert it into something that can be exportable such as gltf that is a it's a non-trivial project but it's 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 an eminently doable all we need to do is convert the geometry uh, to make sure that it's exporting with the correct coordinate spaces and stuff like that, and then to convert the um, the atlas texture from something that is this sign distance field to an alpha threshold, so that such that the GLTF exporter has the ability to to do that, and that that may be as simple as uh, as augmenting the GLTF exporter a little bit. Um, I okay. think yeah, I had a bit of a look at that, but it's um, uh, uh, but but it, it's it's likely something that Adam can help a lot with. Gotcha. Yeah, I hadn't considered going that route. Um, but like as a counterpoint, um, perhaps we don't go that route because um, all of the uh, the geometry data, even if it can be exported, is very very large. Um, and it, right now, how, I how basically like what it, what, are you, what 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 kind of size are you talking? I've about? got like it's like a one and a half megs for just the citation block, which will stack up very fast. Um. So the way I have it currently set up is I'm just I'm saving the actual data of the text separately, and then rebuilding that on import, um, which will be a, fall, a much smaller file size. Uh, I just need to also find a way to clear out the geometry data on export, um, because just of the way I currently have it set up and my rather minimal knowledge of 3JS, uh, to mm -hmm. properly clear that, I would also end up wiping all of the the actual information, which should not be good. Mm -hmm. So one, uh, one, you know, one point five megabytes is a single JPEG these days. Two, uh, what is the geometry if you haven't got the Troika successfully exported at this point? Like, what, what is it that this? It, what is what? What's constituting mm -hmm. one point five megs? So it, it is exporting correctly. Um, it just doesn't import correctly. Um, basically, the shader information uh, doesn't isn't connected to the export, from what I understand. So you get all oh. of the the base geometry information. It loads in, and it's not there. It's no longer Troika text. It's just like data. Um, so you can't edit it. You can't do anything to it. You can't see it. Um, so I'm just I'm working on rebuilding it. Um, and I, I know 1.5 isn't huge for, like in the sense of the scope of an image, but if for mm -hmm. what it is, just a few lines of text, that's way unnecessary. Yeah, and I know it'll stack very sense. fast. Yeah, that, uh, that I do. I I can uh, give you some insights on uh making it better, like how we are doing it, like uh, with the hubs code base which I work. Uh, we have a exporter in Blender, and as you are also trying to export the data with the uh, GLTF export, but with this, if you have a custom exporter extension, and while using your GLTF export, you can include the data. Uh, that you want to have with your custom exporter that you have built. Like suppose your exporter name is 
a exporter so just while doing gltf exporter uh, your gltf file your glb file will have a separate section which is called like a export data and in that you will have all the key value pairs that you want to use so you can just essentially inside your blender itself have a uh, you know data where you can put in the shader information manually or either you can run a script where the blender shader data is taken and converted into the uh, a exported data that you want and it should be like exported uh, in that right so if, yeah. if that sense uh, you can just take it in your 3gs code wherever you want and that particular component you will search for that particular component you will get the coordinates rotation uh, sorry position and rotation and scale and with that you will place the you will place your text wherever you want with those uh, metadata and additionally your shader data you will like have some script where you are decoding the data and you know mapping the values and showing it I mean, if this makes sense, uh, I really find this a very good solution for keeping the, uh, like if you want your shader data with your, uh, text without, you know, uh, if you're going to use a texture atlas, that would also solve the problem, but maybe that would also include more complexities, uh, into. Yeah, no, you, you, you raise a really good point. I think like the, the, the point of this is not for it the the look to be preserved but also in in, in no small amount the the uh, intent and the capability of having text to be preserved and so this is a, actually a, a really good point is that if you have the ability uh, to to have um an exporter importer extension then uh, basically what you're serializing to file is the messages that we are using to throw this stuff over the fence so it's a it, there's a there's a really wonderful synergy there in terms of having a well enough formed uh, sort of uh, schema for the messages because then that means that the actual stuff that you dump into the GLTF is also the messages. Does that make sense? Cool. Andrew, is that, uh, does that make sense as as a way to to get around uh, kind of both of these problems at once? I uh, sort of. Uh, I'll admit it's a little bit foggy um on some of the <laughs> details there um i didn't respond because i thought you were you're still talking about terrific um, um but yeah so, I mean... it's implementation wise um yeah i think i think i've got the idea uh but we're not hmm. never mind i'm not gonna run off of this because i'm <laughs> i'm just gonna start like brainstorming out loud and it's not gonna make any sense oh, cool. um, no, i'll just i'll put a pin in it for now but great stuff sure sure yeah so it's just briefly like the the way that you build a document from one computer to another is by sending the commands over which is functionally what a program does but it's all inside the same program once right. you make that break from uh having a program with function calls to sending messages that give rise to the function calls then you've um you've intermediated between those two sort of motions uh, functionally, what a save file is is just the serialized set of instructions that gives rise to a to a document being composed from the very beginning of its life to the, its its state to date, uh, and so it's just a compression of all of the stuff that you have there. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll go over it again. But that, that's that's in the broad strokes. What happens is that right. once you have this message passing sort of system, then you have the ability to disentangle it in time and in space. Uh, right. And it's like, I, I get that part. I've worked with save systems quite a bit because like I said, I come from the game dev side of things. Um, yeah. And I have that part working um, right now in the current dev build that's not out yet. It's just um, not every piece is currently saving properly. Um, so I'm kind of going through and troubleshooting. That's why I didn't have any build last week. Um, the, the bit I'm more foggy on is what the new suggestion was instead. Um, and because I haven't done it yet. The talking about sort of rebuilding shaders, um, that's a bit more complicated because I don't work on that side so much. Um, so yeah, maybe that's so, what I'll have clarification questions on once I get there. Or yeah, if it's even necessary. Right. Like I said, maybe just passing the data and not worrying about the shaders and just building that from scratch like I'm currently trying to do, maybe that's just mm -hmm. the fastest way to do it. Yeah, I think I think I think that might be right. And I think that's largely in line with Griffith's suggestion there. 
Uh, but Dana, you may, I, may I interrupt for a second? So Frodo's going to be going on to Easter mode pretty soon. He's heading to Japan and he sent out an email message this morning. And I, I frankly didn't understand it. So before you take off on this, on this journey, can you explain to us what you're talking about? Um, when do we start this? What day? What time would that be for folks on the East Coast, West Coast? Yeah, so hang on. I'm just going to say something into our chat. Yeah, so, so what it is, is um, Monday the 8th and Wednesday the 10th, as well as Monday the 15th and Wednesday the 17th, meaning the next two weeks other than this Wednesday. Yeah. If we can change the time, so it's 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. New York, 9 p.m. UK, and 10 p.m. European. Because that way it's 5 a.m. Japan. Otherwise, I just wouldn't survive. I think it's fine, but know that I teach on Wednesday starting at 1.30. And it's I go all the way to 4.10. It's a long class, right? So Wednesdays, I can be there for 30 minutes. And then I have to run downstairs and teach. Mondays, um, there's usually Zoom meetings all damn day, <laughs> like 10 in a row. I'll try to jump out and be here, um, but know that it's hard by the time the day revs up. Okay, so let's make it this way. This Wednesday, we will nail down a few things based on today's conversation, and then we'll essentially have a two-week holiday where those who can will be there and we'll chat general. We'll try not to be very specific Sloan. And if something Sloan comes up, we will try to note it down clearly in the Slack community for the rest of us, whoever couldn't be there to make sure we don't make any inadvertent decisions or any nonsense like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, or we could move the Wednesday meeting to um, noon West Coast time because of that would give me an hour and a half. Yeah, that's four in the morning. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah it's going to be hard because you're. It's going to be hard because you're 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 going very far away. Yeah, I I don't mind the four in the morning in and of itself. It's just the family likes to do things late in the evening, so I just have to follow the. That's okay. I'm just trying to give an alternative. That's fine, and and we can spend two weeks working quietly. If we need help. We can call a meeting or something. Yeah, essentially holiday. Um. So right, so um. Okay, so my second question to you, Brandel, and to you, Andrew, this has been very, very useful to listen to. Is there a time that we can set aside um, where you guys, and maybe with Fabian or Adam, should it be useful, where once Andrew has spent, I don't know, whatever period of time to go through it and really help him nail it? And Andrew, if we're going to have such a meeting, like we kind of had Fridays, how long would you like to work on your own before we have it? I guess it would depend on what the uh, topic of this meeting is. Um, I can always use feedback, um, but it depends on what we're talking about specifically. Uh, if, it, it's, if it's a continuation of this about um, the saving and loading, um, I'm working on it and I'm going to try to have like a base of it working Wednesday. So um, we'll see where I'm at then. Okay. Uh, but if we're talking like the peer to peer, I haven't even touched that. So that would very much be something that we can just pick a time. Uh, Brandel, will you um, be here on Wednesday? Maybe also post Wednesday, I suppose. Uh, this will be a biggie on Wednesday in terms of kind of agreement day, I think. Um, it's also like the way I typically um, prefer to work uh, when I'm on a concept I haven't touched before is I'll like I'll gather the resources. I'll try to implement it for a bit myself so I can get familiar with how code works. Um, and then if I have trouble, um, I'll bring up the question. So okay, I'm fine oh. with meeting before I start, but I would personally rather start working on it first and then come and talk about it. Okay. But that's just me. Boss. I can do whatever people oh, prefer. So, yeah. And in terms of the timing, do you do you, what do you feel like it's worth your time to try to chat on Wednesday? Do you want a little more time to think about these things, chew it over? For Wednesday we're gonna um, meet anyway. Right. Yeah, we'll, no, we'll meet Wednesday can... anyways. Yeah. You're have a separate meeting afterwards? I, I guess I'm not sure where I'll be uh, yeah. with Can development, I but I will have time. Oh, you want me Can to come to, come to campus? Yeah, come to campus on those days. Okay. Uh, I probably won't have time to meet then. Um, I can I can be on campus. Depends on what's necessary. I'll, I'll be available campus. to like message and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can jump yeah, on I, Slack anytime. 
Um, Wonderful. I have Thank a you. very busy day this third, this Wednesday the third. Uh, so I may okay. need to cut my my Wednesday attendance a little short or do it just uh, over audio while I'm at Apple Park. I think some people are going to try to offer me some jobs, and I want to uh, gracefully demur and try to have my cake and eat it. No, that's fine. I'm surprised you're here today, Brandel. You did warn us for the next few weeks you will be very busy, so very grateful. It was it was the last it was the last one. So I I I was up in Seattle last week for proposing model, and it went very well. So I'm really excited. Uh, hopefully, uh, there I'll be able to turn that into public documentation. I drew some teapots, uh, and I feel really good about them. I think they look really it's just really good teapots. Yeah, no, that, that's that's excellent. Yeah, I I mean the 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 tenor or tone of this meeting is a bit different because we had a really good meeting last week well two of them on kind of taking stock and, and writing the ship and now um Dini and i are both putting in very different ways putting our foot down and saying okay we've got to make sure we're walking in the right direction i guess that's why we put feet down right to walk anyway um okay andrew you will work on this stuff when you are ready to ask my developers uh, just put together a paragraph and say i need this that and the other from you and it's my responsibility to make sure that they can do it yeah, uh, honestly, Fred, it, it's it would work better the other way around, um, because uh, well, I just so, implement whatever you, you guys need, want. So you, you don't need to give me a reason, Andrew. If you say that, that's okay. fine. <laughs> what, what I do need from you guys, though, uh, and maybe Brandel, I hope you're still here. What I would like to know is what to tell them. What what in the world are they actually doing? Are they building a server inside Reader, or are they? Is it something we drag on, drag, drag onto a browser window? What, what do I tell them to build? How do you receive it, in other words? The, the actual JSON itself is fine. I'll just tell them to do a JSON, but how to get it to you? Um, I think it's a little early to be able to give them an answer on that at this point. Um, I think I would prefer the, to be a, a substantially uh, understood uh, solution uh, within the web context uh, on Andrew's side before being able to, to uh, make suggestions about the shape that uh, a reader centric uh, or a reader reader based on interconnect um, needs to have. In the broad strokes, it's gonna be the same. So it's gonna need to broker a connection via PeerJS. JS. Um, it's, need, it's gonna need to have an identity, that kind of thing. But because the primary sort of uh, scope of the, of the grant is to be sort of end to end within the, um, within the context of the the web stuff, then uh, I'd love to make sure that we have a, a sense of the, the broad strokes of it on that side before we make recommendations for people in a proprietary language to to, to do that, because my my sense is just that that code is inevitably going to be a little bit harder to change. And so getting a, a stronger sense of what it is in the in the more flexible uh, context is, is going to be instructive. OK, so once Andrew is ready to receive, as it were, uh, we'll look into it because it, it is in the spec, so to speak, that it should be possible for someone to send it up. So we'll do it at the right time. Uh, sure. Andrew, if you feel that I, I'm not delivering because of a misunderstanding, now that Brandel's told me to pause, uh, please don't feel it rude to repeat to me. It's like, we are ready now. You know, I, I may not have heard that. So whenever yeah, you're ready. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. We'll probably talk more Wednesday. We'll have more of a sense for that. Um, but uh just to like reiterate in case I wasn't completely clear, uh, the uh, the content of what I'm given doesn't matter as much because uh, ultimately I'm trying to just build what you guys want me to implement. Um, and I can kind of make it work in different ways depending on what you envision. So I can't really give you a list of, oh, I need you to have these things. Um, I, I need to hear first what you want and then I can tell you what you need to give me. It's it's kind of like yeah. a back and forth. Yeah, so, so that's true, Andrew. Um, but you'll you'll have once you've got the first bit of this done, you'll know what you need to do. What you'll need you'll know what you need to have in order to broker the connection between the the laptop and the headset. And uh, it would be ideal if that is the same style and channel of communication as happens between uh, author reader and uh, and this framework as well so it's not so much that you're the the sole determinant because of your great ideas not that they're not great but that um based on the the expectation of the interop between those two clients 
um, that's going to be the most future forward thing for the, the the folks on the author reader side to be able to sign on to. Uh, right. Danny, do yeah, you have your hand up to, to make an addition or is it just up from, uh, I just see there and, and I don't know. Are you, is you that a new Dini in? hand or is that an old Dini hand? Dini. I'm trying to listen. I'm sorry. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. It, meant, it should have gone down automatically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. So I just, I was, I, I just, I, 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 it, <laughs> was, it was up and then it was up and then, and then I, I wasn't sure if you were trying to get a word. I in have a habit of voting <laughs> a thousand times at faculty Senate meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yes, yes. So, so to address uh, Randall and Andrew on this, um, and, and I'm glad we're going in circles. These are very good circles. Yep. The, the key is, in order to be truly open, the data has to be movable. And yes. the notion of that is visual meta. Visual meta does not mean BibTeX encoding. It just means, it, it's a, such a loose concept. It just means an introduction saying what the data is and then the data, right? So to transfer an entire library, a contextual library, not the internals of every document, in a JSON is entirely fine with that. And we will add a paragraph on top saying what it is so that an LLM or whatever in the future can deal with it, right? That is so core to everything we're doing because let's say Adam does something completely different from your code, Andrew, you should still be able to access the same data. That's really, really important. So um, that is why it's very useful even now, Andrew, for you to, when you're defining your own environment, because okay, what, what do we want to do in your environment? Let's look at it. And, and this is, I think, obvious, but also very important to go through. Until we have passed through an XR, the person will be seated. They will be seated on something like a swivel chair, whether it actually is or not. They'll be seated at the central point and have a 360 degree view. That means that the primary thing they'll be able to do is to move things about and to tap on things to make things happen. So the spatiality of the WebXR is absolutely core. We will have a lot of lists because lists are useful, but things should be able to collapse and expand from that. So based on that, what you have now to be able to send that, forget in a sense, reader and author and all of that stuff, for you to send that back to a thing and someone else to make a rich environment for that really is the key. So what you guys have been talking about for the last half an hour is fantastic to listen to. In a sense, since there's thoughtful silence, the JSON isn't just a transport mechanism. It can also be thought of as a storage mechanism. It isn't really, but it's that important. I want to be able to get to a point where I compete with entirely commercial software that I make my two pennies on. And if you knew how little I made, you would buy me a beer right now or hopefully a coffee. But the point is it should be possible to compete, but it has to be with the same data. And that's why this incredible thing that you have been building so far, Andrew, is so important to import stuff. So does that help you, Andrew, or that, does that make it even more vague? No, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the data you're talking about transferring between the different uh, versions that we can all create here um, it is now more defined than when we started this meeting. Um, I thought you wanted just like something else that would we all be working off of. Uh, but yeah, if we're all working off the same sort of JSON exports, um, that makes sense. So great. So the, the second part of it is uh, architecturally, the way that I see it is that the JSON is the thing what moves. How it moves is entirely secondary. It's important to build now, but let's say we have a great September and great end of year, and Sloan says, oh, this is fantastic, but it has to be really secure, blah, blah, blah. We can entirely change the mechanisms through which this happens, but the JSON stays the same, plus additions. Because at JSON, it's kind of cute. Obviously, we have the inventor of JSON in our community in the book. A JSON is really cute. It's just text saying what the world is. And how could that possibly be more core to what we're doing, right? Literally writing it down. Um, so a little bit to stretch the discussion a little bit on this. What we're talking about for this library are 
in, in addition to the individual document. So in the JSON, each item in the library will be all the normal metadata plus any highlighted text in there, because that can be used for views, plus any entities. These are things we can discuss. Basically, useful lists of stuff inside to help us with views and other things. One thing that I dream about that's not really for now, but I think we need to have a discussion to make sure it fits is having an LLM as being one item, obviously not internal as a thing, but referred to. So that means at some point we can build an environment of knowledge agents like we've talked about in, you know, in space all over the place, pushing and pulling and talking. And the library describes where they are, maybe even basic settings for how they were made or who made them, that kind of stuff. Right. So, of course, we can talk about 3D models and videos and stuff, but it should be anything that can make the environment more interactive and useful should be handleable by the JSON. It ain't just references, obviously, or PDFs. We all agree on that. And the For, favorite yeah. thing about JSON is if we decide to add more data to it later, that doesn't break the older versions. It just adds more on top. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and, and furthermore, things, this whole what should be in there, in this community over the years, we've talked about a lot of things related to timelines and places. Like um, Dini and I had a fantastic week in Washington State. You were there, of course, for most of it, Andrew. But I could very easily imagine, like when we're having sushi that day, if I add a thing to the library, it would be really nice if it knew when it was added as well as where, because this is private to me. So later on, I can do that very basic thing of, where's that thing I wrote when we guys were having sushi in Washington State? These are really useful things that in this multidimensional environment, over time, we can start to search for, right? Yeah, step by step. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, step by step. The, 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 just step, the step, is, step. <laughs> I, I don't want to stress you out, Dini, because obviously you're, 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 you're keeping the brains on this. All I'm saying is just to repeat what Andrew said, actually. We have a basic JSON. We add to it, describes what it is, and over time we can have more dimensional views. Yeah, that's good. I, you know, I said earlier, I feel like a mother sometimes. Actually, I feel like a lion tamer. <laughs> down, lion, down. <laughs> Or maybe dominatrix, who knows? <laughs> Same thing. Get, get, stop it, stop it. <laughs> well, the, um, you know, ar architecturally, everything should be possible. Implementing is something else. But yeah, no, I think we've made real progress today. I'm very grateful. And also- well, we, weren't, we did not follow our, 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 our outline. No, well, <laughs> Again. No, well, the, the outline today, we, we don't really have an outline, but- um, We did, we actually did. <laughs> Yeah, we we can't. We, we never do, we, though, Froda. <laughs> but but on, on Wednesday, we really need to at least nail down the core use cases. And one of the key issues is, you know, like we've been talking about forever in this community, once we know that, where are we going to put it? PDF, web page, Slack, email, text messages in our heads through a dub. You know, once we have these, we'll put it down several places so we can keep referring back to it. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And that's it. We've had a three months um, orienting. Now it's, you know, following the wind and sailing. By the way, are any of you watching Shogun on Disney Plus? No, I just finished three body problem. Uh, Shogun is very good and it gets better and better. Uh, we we're going to start three body. We started one. It's good, right, Danny? Oh my God. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm just finishing up a book called James, which is a a black writer's view of Huckleberry Finn, which is fantastic. As soon as I finish that book, I'm going to pick up Three Body Problem and read the trilogy. I'm so into science fiction. It's just like, it is so great. I'm now on the newsletter list. So I get the newsletters about updates and things. So it's really, really good. Brandon, did you watch it? You're shaking your head. No, I, 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 Read Three Body Problem. I intend to watch it. Uh, I'm also going to pick up a Apple TV Plus subscription in a bit so that I can watch some of the, specifically also the the, the Vision Pro content that's being put out there, uh, 3D movies and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I watched uh, I watched Moving Earth or Wandering Earth. I think it's called. It's this, it's another. It's a Chinese language 
a version a version of a of a Cixin Lu um uh, uh story and uh similar to the Chinese version of three body problem because they did like a 40 episode uh, uh uh version of it there um it's amazing but it's also stunningly like adept by uh uh pro communist propaganda uh which is uh really i don't know funny to see being so expertly executed um I learned, it, but, uh, yeah as I said, I learned I was reading about the book because I'm fascinated by the story. But what the author did in the book was they he put the um, cultural revolution information in the middle of it, yes, so that it would pass the censors. In the actual television series, it's laid out the way he really wanted it laid out, which was it started the whole thing, right? It kicks the whole thing off. That's really funny. Yeah, um, I'm I'm reading. Uh... Too much to know by Anne Blair at the moment, and uh, it's a, it's a wonderful book for uh, understanding information management. Uh, I can Anne Blair. Um, it was at at um at Mark's suggestion. Uh, it's a it's a really fantastic book. Uh, Blair is a has she ever um participated in the community for it? I did try to get to her. Tom Standage suggested, uh, but I didn't hear back. And um, if if we have other access to her, it'd be wonderful. Her, I do have her book right there. Yeah, well, once once I'm once I'm finished reading, I'm gonna try to reach out to her. I think because and I've got some. I think she's at Harvard. Uh, uh, I think I think it would be really interesting because she did a, a an interesting uh, conference back in 2010 called Why Books, uh, which was about the past and future of the book as well. Uh, so so a, a, pr a pretty interesting character. Um, too much to know is a great read. It's not exactly a page turner, but I'm sure Dini and Frodo, you're you're used to that. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I live in that world. It's funny because <laughs> I'm reading this book, um, this this book by Percival Elliott, I think is his last name. He did uh the American fiction. Remember that remember the movie? He did the book for that. And so I'm reading his books now. And it's funny because I can read a novel in like an hour. It's like so easy just to consume it because then I because I read so many things that is just so I take notes and I'm under but even this book I've underlined uh whole passages. Yeah. It's fantastic. So. Yeah, it's it's a, it's just amazing going back to fiction and realizing how effortless and fast it is, and how hours can go by because you cannot do that with these books, no matter how well written written they are. They just, you, you just you you have to be aware of when they're no longer going in. Uh, anyway, so, a, um, but, I have a I have a habit of throwing books across the room when they make me mad. <laughs> and so I have one called the Gutenberg Elegies, which which was written back in the nineties, and it, by Sven. Burkitts, in which he criticizes electronic textuality, you know, anything that's digital. And uh, because you can't smell it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it. I mean, it's not like paper, right? Yeah. And I get like, I read five pages and I would throw it. I pick it up, read another five pages and I'd throw it. So the book is like <laughs> a freaking mess. But it's such a visceral response to asinine, you know, commentary. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. I, I've I've realized that I've taken far too um, prim an attitude toward my books, and I've sort of bent and deformed this in ways that that make it much more legible to me as a, as a body of text. But mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I brought up Blair is because she talked about somebody who purported to have read, reviewed nine thousand books over a period of thirty years, and that's just not not reasonable. Uh, this is in the early days of of writing, uh, of, of printing. Uh, but yeah, like uh, it's uh, it's amazing what you can get away with by and, and so it would have actually read a, 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 like a, a like a small minority of those texts to any uh, to any like at all, let alone to any uh, level of depth. And it's 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 uh, amazing what you can get away with by burying stuff in the middle. <laughs> was I'm going to say this. I was a literature major writing college and then um, went on for humanities after that. And so I've always been a reader. And my, my, as poor as we were growing up, we had a library. My mother had a library for us. So it's not I, I haven't counted how many books, but 9000 wouldn't be out of line for me. I mean, I, this no. is the college reading list. I've read every anytime somebody gives me one, it's like, oh, yeah, I've read all of those. I've read all of those. I've read. I mean, I just read all the time. But you wouldn't have published, you wouldn't have put your name on a published book review for all 9,000 is what I'm saying. No. <laughs> and that, that's, that's over a hundred. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So it, it, that, that was the that was the thing that was striking about it. It's like, that's cheeky. <laughs> yeah. 
There are, I should go back. I mean, that's something you could do in your retirement is go back and review the book. In fact, what I do is I go back and reread books that I thought were hot and cool when I was young, like Herman Hesse. I've read like everything Herman Hesse ever read. I went back and read, you know, um, Narcissus and Goldman. I thought, well, this is crap. <laughs> you know, at 50, it was crap. <laughs> so it's kind of fun that's to go fun. back and reread things. It's kind of interesting, the benefits of paper book reading. One of them is, of course, the rich annotations you can do by scribbling in them. And mm -hmm. the other one is, I, I think when you read and the pages get looser, it, you own it more. That's how I feel. But also you can hold your thumb in the spine and it's easier to hold than a flat thing. But I just because I now have um, author and reader for the tiny iPad, right? I have this amazing little stand. So when I put... I mean, how crazy is this to have a full size keyboard and there's nothing to carry around? It's really nice and minimalist and elegant, but I do think we need to talk a lot more about what annotations mean. You know, it should be possible to scribble. It should be possible to do it in a much richer way than currently. So maybe that's, that's a huge part of what we might do. There's a book that I that I picked up years ago called Marginalia. And it's a, it, this person has done an incredible study on, a margin, on Marginalia going back to the ancient period. Um, the early texts that were held by the Moors in um, in northern Africa, Spain, that area, they had actually written into Aristotle's and Plato's text. And when folks in the West picked up those texts, they thought that was Aristotle's writing. So early marginalia was not even separated from the actual text. And it took a while for people to understand the difference between writing in a text and the text itself, because for the West, everything was text. Everything was, you know, the same author. So it's a wonderful book. And so I'm going to recommend that to you if you, you know, want to pick it up. That sounds excellent. And uh, yeah, very much in line with the sort of this is, this is managing of scholarly information. So it's, it's all about uh, note taking, reference materials, uh, all that kind of stuff. And to realize that text hasn't always just been text is uh, something that it's obvious in a hypertext world, but that, that there are centuries long traditions of having to manage this kind of information and reasonable solutions for doing so is something that was, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, quite new to me. <laughs> I think this goes tails really well back to our JSON discussion because the notion of the JSON representing the library, what is a library? Is it the outside or the inside of a document? It probably should be both. I would really like this JSON to include not only things we have highlighted in our own library, but also the text we've written, annotations and comments, because that means we have access to them from the outside. And one thing in addition to this that I would really like to see is to have documents easily tell what they refer to. A citation is what a section refers to, but we don't have a way for documents now to say that this document is in response to because that way we can start threading things, even in our own environment, which will be interesting. So yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff we need to keep in mind of useful data for us, rather than just the basics. So I need to go to the next meeting. So, hey, Frodo, when do you take off for Japan? Thursday. So Wednesday is a clean and happy day for me. Okay, I'll see you Wednesday. Um, Brandel, thanks for coming. It's good to see you again. And I want to thank Hithric for being here today. Thank you for coming. And I want to thank you for yesterday. That was a wonderful experience. Frodo and I were going to report back to everybody about it, but we didn't get a chance. But it was a wonderful experience. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity to let us talk about this project. It was the first time that we had the chance to kind of present it and... Uh, Frodo made some pretty great slides, and it was our first dog and pony show, right? So thank you for that opportunity. We've got a lot more ahead of us. Yeah, so it's I'd great like to, to meet with you, all of you. I'd like to second Dini on that and just add, Mondays are usually all over the place. Right now we're going through an um, existential crisis of the most fun kind. What have we done and where are we going? So um, we'll be continuing um, to do Wednesdays, project work, Mondays, all over the place. So until Wednesday, for those of us who will join us Wednesday, otherwise Monday, Wednesday, next week at the weird time zones. Hugs to everybody. Email Take me care. Wherever. Bye. Thank Thanks, Peter. Bye, everybody. Bye.